this episode, Sid Probstein, CTO at AI Foundry, talks about his journey as a technologist in the data-driven world. So stay tuned. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Future of Data podcast. Uh, today we have with us Sid Probstein uh, and Sid has been a great uh, friend and advisor and we have been uh, conversing for quite some time and, and this would be, I was looking for an excuse to engage him with our community and this is one of the final excuse and, and thank you uh, Sid for picking that for us. Uh, regarding a quick bio on Sid, uh, Sid Probstein is a CTO and VP of Solution Delivery for AI Foundry, the enterprise software arm and the new face of Codec Alaris. AI Foundry is disrupting the mortgage business by taking originating automation to the next level, enabling self-service, distributed capture and automatic classification, and extraction of scanned and image documents into actionable intelligence. He was previously co-founder and CTO at Ativio and held executive positions at Fast Search and Transfer, Northern Light Technology, and John Hancock Financial Services. So, Sid, uh, amazing bi- bio, by the way, and and we so there are a lot of interesting keywords that probably will will nick and pick as as we go along in the conversation. So, uh, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for for uh, for joining in. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Beautiful. So, as a start, why don't we talk about your journey to this current role? Because I think I have been fascinated with your background, and we have been conversing along um, along our journey. And um, why don't you walk us through uh, like what what brings you here and, and, and your past background with our audience? Sure. So I've been pretty lucky to work in data for, you know, 20 plus years now. Uh, it's funny to think about it. But uh, I started my career at John Hancock Financial Services, which is a, you know, incredible insurance company, still still is. And first project I got to work on was to unify a dozen separate lines of business into a, a single database that we could look at the activity. And it was actually driven by marketing, right, for purposes of cross-selling and things like that. And it was an incredible project. The company really pulled together and uh, and created a, a, a remarkable asset, which was ultimately rolled out into the field force. And I personally felt that this was the sweet spot of interest for me as a technologist you know, it's great to write code. Nothing on earth makes the time pass faster than <laughs> writing code. But solving the problem for business people of how to unify information and produce valuable analytics, that's what I, I personally felt was valuable in the project. In a sense, unifying the information was just a means to an end. And uh, so from there, I went and did some startups like a uh, free email company. And then I got to Northern Light Technology, which was one of the first search engines. Um, competed with Google and GoTo um, and a lot of others, uh, which ultimately became Overture, for example. Um, the thing about Northern Light was it had phenomenal relevancy, but you know that's kind of right to play in search. It also categorized the results in four dimensions, source, subject, language, and type. This was very early, one of the first attempts at applying you know text analytics to the World Wide Web, things like classification. We classified quite a large portion of it. And so what I realized there, and then again, especially at Fast Search, which was a Norwegian search company, um, got to be part of the management team there that uh, really turned the company into an enterprise powerhouse. It was ultimately acquired by, uh, by Microsoft for you know, $1.2 billion uh, some years ago. What I realized across both of those was that search is the model that the user wants. It's the most human way to express a, a kind of interest in data whether you're searching for keywords or you're trying to give some more detailed expression like a goal-oriented search. Give me the names of companies you know, acquired by IBM or Microsoft, right? Mm. If someone has written that web page for you, Google will find it. But from the perspective of a person who works inside a corporation, right, inside the enterprise, behind the firewall, that type of question is very hard to answer because there are, you know, don't have hundreds of millions of people writing out the, the answers to, to these questions. So, from there, right, I said, let's bring these things together, make an expressive way of, of asking questions about data, but also a platform for unifying, and that led to Ativio, which I was delighted to co-found with uh, some folks from Fast. And that company is one of the leaders in enterprise search today and is really unique 
in that it can take highly structured and unstructured data, put it all together. So those things collectively were interesting as infrastructure, but now fast forward a little bit further to AI Foundry. Now, I had done some big data consulting. I love big data. I think it really is different. Um, having gone from that old data warehouse world of conformed data to, you know, doing things in a few days, uh, mm -hmm. writing scripts with, with extracts in, you know, data lakes and using Hadoop and Spark, again, it's still all infrastructure. And so I wanted to take some of that and apply it. And I was did some consulting work for AI Foundry and met the leadership team here I wanted to join because what they're doing at the end of the day is bringing all those things together in the most impactful way for the business user. We are really disrupting the mortgage industry with our origination solution, which picks up where Kodak Alaris leaves off, right? Kodak scanners turn paper into images. Yeah. Our software, which incorporates all the best from, from KA uh, and, and other vendors, right, and, and our own technology, turns those images into structured data, so-called actionable data. Why? Because an image that has to be, you know, a human looks at and types in, or even worse, fills out a boarding sheet for someone else to type in, that is not actionable. That's mm. data entry, and it's error prone, and it's slow, and it's typically managed through things like a clean desk policy. But the opportunity to bring that technology to bear and pump all of that into analytics systems, machine learning systems, business intelligence systems, so that there can be better outcomes with much less effort, that was really what attracted me. And, and I'm delighted to say, you know, we're demoing our solution at a bunch of upcoming shows, Finnovate in New York City next week, and then Digital Mortgage in San Francisco end of the, end of the month. Nice, and nice. It's really all of those things together. It's unification, it's analytics, it's quite sophisticated technology to transform the information from image to actionable intelligence. And uh, it's got the dashboards and everything else that you would want to. Interesting, and and thank you so much, uh, Sid, for for walking us through through the journey. Um, now let's let's talk about your uh, your current role. So, what 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 are some of your primary responsibility um, with the AI Foundry as a CTO? So, so I'm lucky enough to be uh, CTO and head of uh, uh, solution delivery, and you know as CTO we have an incredible opportunity to pull interesting IP from you know all parts of Kodak Alaris mm -hmm. and one of the great companies. Uh, iconic company in America, American history, uh, and still very much, you know, the, the world leader in scanning. So I get to work with a lot of brilliant people in the different divisions uh, and parts of the company. I, I just got back from uh, a day or two in Rochester, uh, where you know, things are still, everything's all headquartered up there. But I also get to work a little bit across lines with our technology partners, right? We don't have to have every piece of the puzzle. We offer a solution. And so I get to work with these vendors and put together, you know, these partners and put together an incredible uh, stack, if you will, that really addresses the business needs of, of our customers. But along with that, working with our professional services team, we get to actually live the implementation, right? And to mm -hmm. understand what really matters to the customer. And personally, I am all about that loop of understanding, you know, how what's difficult, what creates friction, where are the real points of value, if you will, and making sure that those things are just packaged into an ever improving, you know, experience. Because at the end of the day, that's what people want. They don't want technology, they want the answer, they want the service, and they want it easy now, and typically operationally, you know, expense, mm. right, and in the cloud. So those are, I feel super lucky to, to be able to work with that. And, and, you know, I support a tremendous, tremendous team of, of uh, athletes, mixes <laughs> of uh, PM, uh, developer backgrounds and, and amazing architecture skills. Man, many of them have built entire products on their own. Interesting, interesting. Um, so let's talk about Codec Alaris. So what, what exactly is Codec Alaris? Uh, if you can shed some light on that. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. So, you know, Eastman Kodak is, again, the, the uh, iconic American company that I invented so much in photography and film. Um, the company obviously had some challenges. There's a Harvard case study about that um, and, and has, has gone through a lot of changes. So Kodak Alaris is the scanning division, really you know, the enterprise division, if you will, and it's the world leader in scanning. Some unbelievably sophisticated stuff. I was, last time I was in Rochester, got to see the user experience have these remarkable scans are like robots, right? They pull apart pages and, and figure out the separation. There's a tremendous amount of smarts in them. And those are used by a huge number of, of leading banks in the enterprise, about 45% of the market. And it's a, it's a great business in that it's very profitable and managed. At the end of the day, what, we, we do, what we're doing at AI Foundry 
is linking up with that business, right? Those scanners are producing images, and there's a lot of technology like phenomenal distributed capture capabilities. Uh, our Info Input Express product, for example, is available in the Apple Store, the iOS Store, uh, Android Store. This turns any device into a distributed capture with secure capabilities, right? You can't pull the data into the camera roll. It can be delivered directly to a sophisticated back end that does very much what we, we talked about, classifying the documents, routing them, extracting fields, you know, things like social security number. That's the core technology, right, that we bring to bear. And so, so Kodak Alaris obviously is, is our big brother. And uh, together, right, we are focused on solving the problem of automating the, the handling of paper data. Interesting. And, and, and what about um, AI Foundry? So what, what's AI Foundry's role in that, if you can shed some light? So, so really, our focus is on picking up from those images, and our technology solution transforms that those images into structured data. So, you know, we're all familiar. Take a photograph of a page, right? Probably we've all done this at one time or another, and um, especially if you've done a mortgage, right? It's very common. In fact, I spent when I did a mortgage recently. Um, I think I must have taken thirty or forty, you know, scans or pictures with my phone, mm -hmm. and I mailed them to the bank, and it was great, honestly. A phenomenal experience from the perspective of a, a borrower or a customer. Um, it was like having a concierge. I, unlike previous mortgages I've done in the past, I didn't have to go in. I didn't have to really go find a notary. But there was a challenge, and that challenge was that after a few days after I'd sent everything in, I needed to go to Europe, and I didn't want to bring all of my paperwork with me on the you know mm -hmm. odds that they needed one more piece of paper. So I called the bank and I said, "Do you have everything that you need for me?" And I'll never forget the sound in the voice of the sales person or a rep who took took my call it was as if I'd asked for something you know really difficult right like what's 42 mean is the answer to at life the universe and everything <laughs> and that momentary catch in the voice and he said he would get back to me he did not actually the manager of the branch got back to me and said look we're trying it's really hard for us to verify that we have everything um, it's gonna take us another day or so and so the good news is they did get back to me Monday before I left but what I realized is it's part and parcel of the way the current State of the art in mortgage. Those documents come in as scans. There's no structured data. They could easily be lost if they were mailed to the wrong address or accidentally misfiled. I think that's quite rare, hmm. but the cost of those things is very high. And from an experience perspective, it's it's you know not good when it does happen. But even more than that, it's about the unpredictability, right? You know, there are things like clean desk policies to try and get you know a loan package that arrives on someone's desk off the desk by the end of that day, but. It's an unmanaged process, and that's why it was so hard for them to know. They know it'll be done in a couple weeks, but they don't know exactly when, and there's no way for me to find out without calling. So that's a costly, not great process. I, mean, I often challenge clients, what would be the Amazon experience for mortgage? What would be the Google experience? You know it would be easy. You'd get everything done up front. You'd be 100% clear about that, and you'd get a text message right when the mortgage arrived, just the same way I get one when a package is delivered to my house. So. But it's hard, you know. Some of the biggest mm -hmm. banks are able to implement those kinds of solutions, and they they put a lot of effort and and investment into digital transformation. But for everyone else, we need a more built solution that we can drop in. That's what we have. We can deploy it on cloud, uh, in cloud or on premises, and it can be as simple as a shared folder, or it's also a web service if you want to call into that. Um, we have pre integrations for a lot of the existing self service portals and things like that that are out there, and so. The documents get uploaded by the user. We also have a portal that we can supply if they want. We'll be demoing that, by the way, at, at Finnovate, as mentioned, in Digital Mortgage. Once they upload those documents, the old model is the documents go in and then you wait. The new model is maybe there's a spinner for a second as the document gets processed, and the system comes back and says, this document's acceptable. Or perhaps it says, no, there's a miss missing field, uh, or this this particular part of it is, is illegible. Right. So they the consumer, the borrower, is able to quickly go through the process, have certainty that they have completely uploaded the right documents, that they've been accepted. And we often, we, we even offer a checklist, right? It's a dashboard. This can be internal or external. The dashboard can show the loan originators, the people who actually process the loans and management, the status of, the, of an individual loan or rolled up what the status of all the loans are. And so mm -hmm. which ones have exceptions, which ones have missing uh, documents, which fields are particularly problematic. So all of a sudden you get data. And you can expose that data as well to the end user through the portal. You've uploaded seven of ten documents, right? So you can know exactly where you're, what the status is, and that's sort of the on ramp to doing lots of things. Whether you you know then want to automate the process of creating a loan in your loan origination system, 
right? Or you want to place it into some other workflow. Let's face it, right? As even with phenomenal, super high quality extraction, there's still compliance and, and regulatory reasons for a human to look at it. But eliminating that time, cost, effort, and the sort of anti-digital or non-digital experience that it provides, that's what we're all about. True. No, I think that's uh, definitely, uh, thank you so much for walking us through that. I think one of the things that, 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 that you said, which um, caught my attention is regulatory sort of bottlenecks, right? Uh, that are out there. And and whether it's mortgage, whether it's uh, banking, whether it's uh, insurance, it's like these guys are extremely regulated industries or whether it's healthcare and all that. How, so, and, and these technologies that you are work, that you are mentioning and you're working on, these, these are very disrupting to the entire, to the patient the core of the process, which is actually in a way slowing these things down. On the other side, the culture and the law and everything is built around that sophistication of, or that sort of um, doing this lame paper-based uh, paper trail thingy. So what are some of the challenges that you see um, when, when you're disrupting uh, something like this? Like what are some of, if you can shed some light? Well, I think I think there are a lot of them. You know, there are certainly um, cultural barriers in the sense that banking culture is very much about verification and, and that human step. And so, you know, it can be hard to adopt a technology solution like that uh, com comfortably. And I think that, but that's becoming more and more the norm. You know, two, three years ago, I don't think we would have been talking about cloud for this kind of solution at all. And yet I can tell you that most of our clients are deploying in cloud now. So that's a giant shift, right? So. So culture changes very quickly sometimes, especially when the right right benefit is available. Um, another point, though, is compliance, right? There is a need to keep documents, but there's also a lot of requirements around doing comparisons between documents and comparisons with outside services like credit reporting or, mm -hmm. you know, there are, there are all kinds of op opportunities, frankly, to, to get information about, about borrowers, assuming they consent. Um, so linking all that up automatically and participating in that sort of what I'll call the API economy, right, where hmm. um, the bank may be using a variety of systems outside their firewall to understand and provide the best experience. We, we want to be able to participate in that, and, and that's, that's something that um, I'm really pleased to see many banks are ap approaching the world that way, right? So they as long as they have a way of maintaining compliance and having those right human checkpoints, which our solution enforces in all of those workflows and with the UIs, there's real interest in and, and real willingness to, to, to change the way that they do business. Um, again, especially as for the benefit that they see. Interesting, interesting. So um, let's let's talk about the technologies that, that are available today. So the optical scanners are, are all, all like and then analyzing this into digital image and then analyzing it through data. Like how efficient are are, are, are they right now? Like, because uh, I remember doing uh, for one of one of my startups early on, um, I use um, I think Nuance API or something, and it was it was crappy then. It's like five, six, seven years back. So what what, what how are things now? We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Well, I think, so I'll tell you that I haven't met with a lot of banks or financial services institutions that haven't complained about OCR, you know, <laughs> in the past decade or so. But a lot of those experiences are five plus or 10 plus years old. I literally heard that exact quote. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, OCR is one of the tools in the toolbox that's required to make sense of images. And again, Kodak Alaris is the world leader in scanning, and we have an IP around this that goes incredibly deep, incredibly far. I'm, I'm super proud to be able to, to work with it, to be honest with you. It's very exciting stuff, uh, even if it's a little geeky. But mm -hmm. things like OCR have to be supplemented with sophisticated region detection, type of the region detection, classification, um, being able to say, is this a type of document, that's one thing, but how about is this region a barcode? Is this a handwritten section? Um, using machine learning and uh, other advanced techniques to go figure out the, the space that is actually consumed by a field or figure out what the title of a field is, those are all things we bring to bear along with newer technology in the realm of glyph space. So I don't know if you've heard the term, but a glyph is to a picture what a letter is mm -hmm. to a word. And so by extracting chunks of images, especially non-rotational scale invariant features, 
uh, the system is able to make a much more sophisticated analysis. When this is all then combined into a confidence score, actually multiple confidence scores because you can look at how confident you were with respect to discovering the region, then the OCR within that, and the discovery of the title, that allows you to really automate the process, set those thresholds in a meaningful way, and get much, much better results. Interesting. And and I think uh, uh, before before our conversation, I was uh, I think you you briefly talked about um, like you have a extensive experience in in data in, in in managing data and maintaining data and all that, and and when we talk about um, something like um, scanners or 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 image processors, so it pretty much require a new new way to sort of store data or a new way to analyze data, so. How is that shift happening? If you can walk us through uh, your experience on what what you had seen previously and what you're seeing now, what is that shift, and and uh, and what do you hope is is happening, and probably will see in the future uh, with this evolution? So I think it's there's a lot happening in terms of the storage and the processing. Storage, let's face it, the architecture these days is is very much you know lots and lots of commodity servers, usually in the cloud. Mm -hmm and uh, using key value stores like S3, et cetera. Um, and I don't think, frankly, we have the opportunity to change the way that that storage happens, right? That's very much a, a client-driven feature. Uh, and, and that's partly because of compliance and regulatory. They need to maintain control over the data through every step. What we will see, we see a lot of now is encryption, encryption on disk, encryption on indices, right? Encryption between phases. And uh, we also see a lot of masking, right? So very often we'll do processing where we replace PII with uh, GUIDs and store those securely elsewhere so that perhaps the processing at the end, if you do need to go back to the customer name, and this is particularly important for aggregates, right? You can go back to that customer, but you go through a more secure behind the firewall model. So there's a lot of that happening. The other piece is intelligent workflow and routing. So, um, you know, once you turn a document into data, you don't have to treat it like every other document. You could say, oh, we have the 10 pieces we need to route this to stage C as opposed to going through A and B first. So we're seeing a lot of investment in intelligent routing and the ability to consume services right broadly in the cloud. So we can be exposed as a service that does classify and extract, also capture, right, and, and provide the analytics. But perhaps they want to view that in Domo or they want to pull that into, you know, a, a cloud version of Tableau or Data Mirror or any of the, you know, zillion services out there that visualize things. And I'm not necessarily endorsing any of those. Just mm -hmm. saying that those are some of the things that people are doing with it. Um, and and that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a big change because it used to be very siloed, right? You're going to put it in our data warehouse. It's in our conformed data environment behind the firewall. Here's your loading process. Here's the conform process you need to follow through, right? Here's the ETL. I think it's... One of the great things I can say is I hear that ETL term so infrequently, and I can tell you mm. 10 years ago in the data unification, unified data space, ETL was you know one of the most popular uh, acronyms to hear. And um, now we hear about analytics, automation, uh, robotic automation, and process automation. Right? Those are those are the things that people are focused on, because let's face it, the benefits of those things significantly outweigh right something like one of those older ideas. I, that's true, and I think um, so. You brought up an interesting point and many of our community members talks about so they're from the ETL background and they say hey uh, what's the future what should I do what should I do next right so how can I prep myself with this now data lake phenomena and I'm from a, a traditional data warehousing uh, thing and so what are some of your thoughts to uh, anyone sort of working on the legacy architectures today because businesses are still supporting uh, these legacy models so what they can do to sort of harmlessly upgrade themselves to to this new model it's a great question. Um, I will say this. I have seen truly remarkable results come from taking the big data approach. And I want to talk about that. I think, um, uh, you know, Jeff, Jeff Hammerbacker, the very famous uh, uh, data scientist, has said he, he, uh, he said, on the one hand, that uh, some of the greatest minds of our generation spend so much time clicking ads. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, or figure out how to get people to click more ads. On the other hand, he talks about the open source process that is very much a part of big data. It's not just the software, which does tend to be open source, but it's the collaborative approach, you know, groups, teams of data scientists, business experts, subject matter experts, all focusing on data in a data lake type of environment, right, with a much more freewheeling, non-conformed model, where you're not necessarily getting perfect answers, I meaning I don't need to score every single customer exactly correctly. I'm trying to get a bulk understanding 
right? What are the broad clusters of my customers? What are their behaviors, right? It's not the same thing. And when you take that approach, you produce results remarkably quickly. One example I'll give you is for a large insurance client in a previous life when I was consulting, their internal IT with their conformed data environment behind the firewall, and I'm talking classic, you know, uh, operational systems ETL'd up into a into a data warehouse and then individual data marts created with BI stacks on top so you could look at different things. It was sort of going to be about an 18 month process to do what I would call fairly straightforward key performance indicators right on some data that they hadn't really looked at previously and in particular they wanted to combine it with some external data to do benchmarking and the the big delay if you will in getting all of it was the possibility of loading those external sets into the data warehouse so that the single query could be made. And so that caused much consternation. On the other hand, the same IT folks who said this will take us a long time said, why don't you use the data lake in the cloud? Mm -hmm. And they produced extracts of all the data very quickly, right? Good at extracting data out. And then brought some data scientists and a team of analysts and, and SMEs together. And they were able to write some pig scripts, some Python scripts. And did they produce you know, perfect data that could be used you could expose to any of the subjects of the performance system without them necessarily saying that might not be right? No, of course not. But the numbers it produced in aggregate were superb. They were mm. incredibly valuable and it took a matter of weeks. And it's not just the, it's not the technology. There, there are certainly wonderful things about the technologies like Hadoop and Spark, but it's much more about the approach and the um, separation from all of that legacy conformed environment, which plays an important role in the back office of the, you know, of the, the, the data warehouse, that's important. But the new insights that produce tremendous value today, they come from the newer approach, that open source mentality, if not software. Interesting. That's what I think is critical. How to get into it? Start in the cloud, anonymize the data, right? So that, as I described earlier, you don't have to put PII up there, put a GUID in, have that behind the firewall mapped back to your customer ID move the data in the cloud, create a catalog so that people can see it, have the ability to you know, let people search through the catalog and fill their cart, if you will, with the uh, interesting pieces of data and check that out, provision it off into you know, whatever kind of sandbox they need to do the work with the tool set that they want. When you create that kind of uh, setup inside your organization, all of a sudden you'll be amazed at how many questions get answered and how mm. little work you have to do to spin up the infrastructure. Interesting, interesting. No, I think um, that's that's p perfectly valid, and 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 thanks for the solution, by the way. So one thing that we hear a lot from, so to me, you represent from the tech side of of data science coming into the business, right? So that's a that's a beautiful mix because I think we uh, talk about we talk to a lot of IT folks who said, okay, I want to get something done. And, and I think one of the interview with one of the CIOs narrated the best, he said, Michelle, my job is to keep the lights on and not to uh, replace it or something. So right. so I said, okay, perfectly valid. But then if you are a, a tech uh, team or, or, or basically uh, staff or ops team uh, underneath him, so there's very little room for innovation. There's very, very little room to sort of introduce new technology, uh, new science. It's legacy old, they're supporting that. So what are some of the hacks or some of the suggestions? Because I think you have, you're one of those, those folks who have mastered this craft of breaking the mold and going into big data and sort of creating a bigger horizon for companies. So what are some of your thoughts on what these individuals who are at least stuck on the cultural sort of uh, diaspora of where they want to get to, how they can do something um, to, to sort of sell this idea of big data and, and all that? And any key insights on those? We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Oh, I, I definitely think that's a great question. You know, nowadays, things are about show me. Hmm. It used to be so much, you know, convincing, make the case, pull together the data, but haven't we all done enough purchasing of systems, installation of systems where, you know, it's kind of based on either references or, you know, the data sheet or a great demo. And nowadays people want to touch, they want to download, they want to play with it. So, some people want a solution, but in that data world, that's what rules when you're looking at products, right? It's sort of pieces of infrastructure that you could build on. And so the big things I come back to are take a small amount of time and try to prove an idea using big data methods. 
I've actually worked with several companies which have innovation processes that are totally driven that way. So they literally say, please don't let your great ideas die in the parking lot, right? And I, I think the, mm. the story behind that is, you know, people have great ideas in the shower or when they're jogging or whatever it is, and then by the time they get to work and park, they've talked themselves out of it mm. because it's going to take too many servers, you know, we don't have that software in-house, we don't have that skill set. So what they did, what several of these companies have done is, is let's allocate some time to ideas that pass a gate. And so have a group of people who reviewed these ideas, but kick lots of them out and say, we're going to put an engineer on this for two days or three days or maybe a week. and. And I think if you're if they can then quickly produce results that indicate that there's something to this, then maybe you advance it to a little bit larger investment. And I think taking the same approach for someone who's you know trying to innovate in the conformed environment, trying to move faster, it's all about a few skunk works projects, right? Put, put a, together a couple of small bets and make sure that they pay off, and use those to kind of lead the way. And I think what happens, right, is that budget goes where where the solutions actually deliver value. And so, um, not to say that the conformed data environment doesn't, but it probably isn't a place for lots of new analysis and analytics to come through. So start moving into that new world through small projects, cloud-based projects, we're once very careful about the data, right? And, and show that, yeah, we can do things in a few days or a few weeks or a few months, depending on the time scale, right? It's all relative. Interesting. And confidence. And also expertise. The, the, the last point I'll make is, I think it's incumbent on every engineer, every geek, me included, to stay current, right? And write some Python. Uh, go and you know look at deep learning for J. Go and uh, figure out you know what what some of the hotter projects are and get involved. You know even if you're not a programmer but you want to understand how something works, go help write the documentation. Some of my favorite people in open source are phenomenal documentation writers who make mm -hmm. it possible to consume the stuff. I mean, pitch in, help out, uh, maybe do a nonprofit or some kind of volunteer project. It's another way to, to, to find out what, what's possible. Everyone should be excited by the art of the possible these days. We, we live in an era where science fiction, everything that was science fiction with that when I was a kid, pretty much, is real now. We yeah, that's true. Not quite the flying cars and teleportation, transportation seems to be a little bit further off if I'm to believe uh, Professor uh, Kako who writes about uh, the future, you know, futurism, Michio, Michio Kako is mm. one of the great authors in this stuff. Um, you know, he had, he had a whole book about predicting the difficulties of, of some of the advancements, right? And so teleportation ESP may be far off, but most mm. everything else, like the phone here, right, this incredible device, that we, we're so lucky to live in that era. Everyone should, should find some, I believe, should find something in there for them. Interesting. Regardless. Interesting. So, uh, uh, one other area that that I think last time we connected, uh, uh, probably a, a year back or so. Uh, so you're talking about. So you you also help uh, CXOs. You're a chief data self CXO strategist, and you're trying to help them sort of get their get their mind straight and, and on things. So if you can shed some light on some, what are some of the challenges on the leadership level that that, that you have seen that are that are sort of that we should be wary about or, or like what are some of the opportunities there? So uh, there's really three things that come to mind. The first one is there's this constant challenge between cost and investment and so you know a lot of CXOs are driven by cost. It's very easy to spot, it's easy to identify on the report, on the dashboard and it's in some sense easy to control, right? I can very tractably decide what to do inside my organization the harder part is to think about how can I achieve the benefit that I want, which is maybe more revenue, more profits, right, by investing in growth and doing it without the sort of big bang model, right? Don't have to take $10 million to produce a few million increase in the first year and then maybe five million in the next year, right, with a great deal of uncertainty and ever-changing competitive landscape. You know, think about using social media. Think about using hackathons. Think about using open source technologies to try and close some of those gaps. And if you think that way, and you can figure out how to free people up, right, or create maybe an innovation day, give people that additional time in your, in your organization to do it, those are the things that I think produce the greatest results. So I, I, I really am a big believer in small bets of different kinds. Uh, I think a second one is, you know, learning from what others are doing, getting out to conferences and seeing what is state of the art. And obviously, you don't see true state of the art at conferences, but you can get a hint of, a hint of it. Um, and I think that's important. And along with that, I would say I love, and of course, we met through social networking. Um, 
I once said, I think, that I thought Twitter was a fad. I said it to a really great marketing guy, and he mocked me relentlessly for the next 10 years. He was totally correct. Um, I was correct about CDs being more of a transitional state, right, than uh, mm. between record and MP3 player. But Twitter obviously has tremendous ability, uh, not as a publishing platform. It's certainly fine there. There are plenty of great ones. Um, but it's much more about a news feed curated by people that you are interested in what they're doing. And so getting out on social media, mixing it up, LinkedIn too to some degree, these are great ways to discover new approaches and learn about what, you know, the incredible ideas that other CXOs are coming up with. So, so I'm a huge believer in all three of those things. Experiments, uh, really getting out and seeing what's going on in the marketplace, and then using social media to understand uh, the landscape a little bit better. Interesting. Um, thank you so much for, for shedding light on that. Um, I think the other thing that, that I'm, I want to ask you, um, and we don't have too many CTOs on the show, so you have one of those. So, uh, and you are, in fact, you're a very data savvy CTO, right? So you understand data pretty in and out and all that. So how do you see that your role sort of uh, works with chief data officer and chief, uh, chief analytics officer? Like CTO, because CTO is the enabler to me, like they're, they're, they're the technology enabler. And, and as you said that uh, you want to create a delivery uh, model. So what are you thinking on, uh, what, what's your thinking on uh, how how CDO is CTO like? How how are these roles sort of uh, where where they all overlap? So I think that's a, that's another great question. Um, you know, the C, chief analytic officer is really trying to determine the the business metrics, if you will, mm -hmm. right? The a analytics that are important to the business, to individual business units, to automation. It's a really tough job in the sense that you have to end up, you know, start at the goal and then work backwards. What are the analytics we need to put in place? How do those flow together? CDO, I think, Chief Digital Officer, traditionally is about transformation in many organizations. Um, and it can be actually very much an IT function in some places where it's about modernizing the infrastructure, getting BYOD in place. But I've certainly seen examples where it's much more broad in terms of the cultural impact. It can be, you know, um, changing HR structures like moving to unlimited PTO or um, you know eliminating performance reviews. Um, so CDO it, it can be very broad, and I think the great CDOs um, focus on digital experience in their products mm. and services. Uh, not to say that the whole organization isn't important, but that at the end of the day is where the competition really starts. Right? Is is at the front end of the products and the services. So I think that's important. CTO can be a bunch of different things. Um, you know. I would differentiate it from CIO. CIO is focused on infrastructure and mm -hmm. is typically kind of very tied to the CDO in a traditional organization. CTO, in my view, should not focus on things like cost. I actually don't think architecture even necessarily or things like standards. That's more CDO, CIO work, especially CIO. But they should be focused on innovation in the sense that what are the technologies that will support both the digital expansion transformation of the company and the analytics machine learning that are necessary. It can also be a lot about right the, the staffing, the organization. What are the skill sets that we need? What are the in investments that need to be made? Yes, in infrastructure, but more than that, in products and in, in um, architectural approaches, not standards, right? Things like CTO maybe is, would say, we need to migrate to a microservice architecture. We need to bring in mm -hmm. products X, Y, and Z, AI Foundry, Classify, and Extract. We need to make these shared services so that CAO goal can be implemented by CDO, who is supported by a dev organization reports to the CIO. Put those pieces in place for next year, right? And on the other end of the spectrum, it's, you know, CDO wants to change the way a product is offered, right? And so CTO may say, oh, this is the, you know, provider, the partner we might use. These are the technologies we'd bring in. This is the IP we have in house to make that happen. So I'd see it's all kind of a triangle, if you will, and hmm. hopefully one that works in a very virtuous cycle. Interesting. And I think one thing that um, that I, I definitely want to ask uh, from you uh, is um, your experience. So you, you have been a CTO of a startup, co-founding, bringing it from the scratch and bringing grounding up, uh, ground up to a very successful startup, and then working on a startup within a big entity in, in, in certain ways. It's, it's still, a, it's still the, the culture is still relevant. It's still a, um, a corporate entity. What are some of the some of the similarities or, or, or differences between between uh, CTO of a startup and a CTO of um, a, a, a well-groomed uh, company? 
So a great question too. So I think the difference these days between startup and the kind of business unit that we are, right, is that you start with scale. I'm sure you've heard the term, uh, you know, MVP, lean startup approaches. Uh, I, I think I recently read, I may be wrong, so I apologize in advance if I am, but I think the average seed investment now for software startups is $250,000. And it's, to get to a minimum viable product on that, it's a very different kind of approach, almost requires a lot of volunteering and mm. you have to be incredibly focused and all about making, you know, the first mouse trap work and catch a mouse. And then you go and raise money to get, you know, a couple more mouse traps, right? Things like that. It's it's a very different strategy. And, you know, I think great CTOs nowadays for that side, they are very hands-on. They are right in the mix. And they are not so customer focused uh, other than to understand the problem, right? That how to get the mouse and trap to work together for the person who wants to deploy it. It's a very different focus. And um, it, it is it is less about, you know, the the network and more about the technology and the implementation. Uh, that's that's what I've I've seen over the last couple of years. Um, on the other hand, when you are incubating inside a larger company, you start with scale. Things like access mm -hmm. to customers. You can bring more of those network and, and business side capabilities to bear, but you still need to be you know if not fully hands on, you have to be very close to it. And so that's why you know. I don't view it. I don't view my role as being kind of a think tank, uh, you know, content creator. I work directly with our services team. I support our services team in implementing the solutions, literally in a hands-on way. I'll, as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to wander down to the bullpen and literally spend time with them, and it, that will include, you know, actually working through problems and opportunities. We do that very much as a team. So I think that's the that's one of the differences. But the other piece of it is. I spend a lot of time working with the larger right, clients and the larger, you know, our big brother Kodak, uh, Alaris, because there's so much opportunity to drive things by making use of those things, by levering it. If, if I operated in that lean startup mode, I wouldn't see the outside mm -hmm. world enough and, and that's a big difference. So um, I, I think that that's, uh, that's not a totally new concept, but I think it's more pronounced for, than ever before now in the startup world, right? Because because of the the vast number of startups and entrepreneurs and and the the pressure, you know, to to find a differentiated space. I was reminded just recently that there was a big data landscape that just came in. I think it has forty five hundred companies in a hundred categories. That's right. a number, right? Think how many per category that is, and mm -hmm. that's a lot of categories, right? Now you're kind of splitting hairs between like analytic database and you know, not only SQL database and document database and this database, that database. It's a wonderful renaissance, but one wonders if they can all survive, all find meaningful value points. And, and so I think that's where you see VCs and seed funders, right, pushing mm -hmm. back a little bit and saying, really need to nail something smaller uh, that works and then grow from there. Interesting. A lot of it is open too, right? So yeah. take an open source thing that's been proven and now let's let's package it up. Interesting, and I think you you raise an interesting point um, that there there's there are a lot of um, brands and products out there. So what are, what are some of some of as, as a technologist, right, and or a technology commerci commercialization guy, like what are some of your hacks to quantify a, a product whenever whenever you are considering for a, for a company? Uh, like if and and we can we can pretty much head into the the build versus buy conversation of like how do you how do you sort of evaluate those situations? So I think it comes down to prototyping, but I, you know, let's just be honest. For starters, look at open source. It's free, super high quality. You know, there are products out there that have some of the greatest minds in data science, in programming out there. Uh, you know, Doug Cutting, you know, at Yahoo wrote <laughs> wrote Hadoop and and Lucene, and and these are fundamental building blocks mm. now, right? For for a lot of enterprise projects. Not to say that there aren't great alternatives and takes, but you should start there. And in my view, the key is, do you see a robust community? And are you able to get moving with the project? My favorite thing now is to say, OK, you have a Python API? Let me try it. And you know, sometimes that's spectacular. You go, wow, this can participate. And we have built things with a few thousand lines of Python you know, on top of pack open source packages to do things like image science. They're unbelievably good. In other cases, it's not out there. It doesn't exist today. And we go and we find you know the IP from from KA, uh, from IM, from the other other parts of our organization, or we license that from from partners. But I look for frictionless, 
and I look for quality, right? So in other cases, I've looked at an open source project or even a commercial project, and you know the Python API didn't work, would only accept strings or whatever it is, and you say, okay, not that's not the, the route I want to go down because it's it's too much friction. Unless I, you know, unless I have to, if that's the only one out there, then I'll mm -hmm. I'll make my way through. Obviously, one of the great things about being in startups of all kinds, right, is that at the end of the day, they bring us on board. The funding is here to make us to go through walls. And it's our willingness to do that, right, that, that sets us apart from, um, you know, non-growing startups or non-growing concerns. Uh, mm. and so I think, I think those two things together, right, make, make progress, do it frictionlessly, um, and respect quality. Uh, you know, somebody wrote the most brilliant open source project software but can't document it or mm. can't attract someone who can document it, right? That That's kind of a warning sign. Mm. Again, it might be interesting, but I try to see what supports me moving quickly, what my team likes and is moving quickly with. Those are those are the things that, that really make yeah, those are the those are the markers of something successful to work with. Interesting. And and thank you uh, so much for, for walking us through that. Um, one another sort of I, recently I was conversing with one of the enterprise software guy uh, about uh, the challenges with the leadership now to pick a software and I think it's it just it just segue into this particular segment uh, pretty well so say for an example a, a, a big software with a, comes with its own ecosystem right so you, you you pretty much you're secure but at the, on, the, on the other side a lot more lot less agile and you have to get by through that and the other uh, the other ecosystem is very distributed, very appified. Everything is an app, and you you acquire that, and you sort of it's like pretty much putting things on a band aid. It's a lot of band aids together to make things stick together. So as 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 a CTO, like what what are some of the some of your key insights into um, sort of helping other who soon to be um, to evaluate with which road to to navigate, whether to go for a bigger, heavier, and thicker ecosystem, or whether to be like extremely uh, uh, duct taped ecosystem getting things to work or something the best piece of advice I can possibly give in this regard is to know yourself and your organization there are many organizations that are fundamentally great at building software that they purchase they're or they're fundamentally great at building software you know banks for example have traditionally built their own applications because there were not so many providers that's changed a lot but it's important to realize, is that really your skill or are you just doing a lot of it, right? And um, on the other hand, some companies are much better at buying and integrating, right? Or they have partnerships or, or they prefer and get value out of big stacks. That's the important thing. What's, what I, when I see things go wrong in that regard, it's usually because there's a mismatch in the desire, right? Well, we have traditionally bought software, but now because I've read about, you know, seen a lot of interest in open source and we found a great engineer who wanted to do some of that, we started open source and very often what I hear after that is it's not going very well right hmm. on the other hand I've seen plenty of examples where people try to buy software like a big stack oh we need to buy a BI tool because we can't build one or the open source one is not good enough or doesn't meet the needs of our business users and we're having a really tough time with that right because they're really great at building software and perhaps if they you know uh, had said look we're gonna take open source and we're gonna work on refining it they might have produced that same result in sort of at the same time so so I think that's incre incredibly important to to just be realistic about it. Uh, and the other thing is right, to keep an eye on the, the technical debt. If you are going to build, um, it's great to meet the business user's needs, but you also have to reserve time for you know industrialization, for QA, for uh, you know remediation of issues, for um, updates, right? And so the piece that that I think is is often missing is to have a blended organization where you have people who, if you will, would fit into the different parts of, say, a Dungeons and Dragons party, right? You mm. don't want to have just wizards. Wizards, uh, you know, traditionally can put together tremendous magic, but if you have to, you know, fight a bunch of orcs or whatever it is to go a little bit too far with this analogy, the wizards may or may not be the best thing if there's enough of them or a magic-resistant monster. So, so you need fighters and you need, you need clerics and you need, uh, you know, rogues and all those different pieces. So, you need people who love to do sustaining engineering. You need people who love to work with customers and be in the field. You need people who want to work on new stuff and are great at tracking multiple open source projects, knitting it together and making sense of it. You need to build an organization that has enough of those roles based on whether you build or buy, right? And then be true to those things. And I think the organizations that, that I see as being tremendously successful, they are all about that honesty, right? They are, they commit mm -hmm. to being what they are and then they do a great job at it. 
Interesting. So, and, uh, you know, I think thank you so much for walking us uh, through that. Um, one area I, I definitely want to sort of segue into this is uh, team dynamics, right? So, putting together a team. Like, what are what are some of uh, some of your your thoughts on who to hire? Like, uh, so whenever you look look in uh, uh, for a teammate or a team member or, or or a candidate working with your with with your team, what are some of the things that you look for? So for me, it's it's really a couple of things. One is some um, love of technology. Uh, I, I think that mm. it is so much easier to you know put in the occasional night or weekend when you aren't doing it because it's a job, but because you're actually interested in it. So I love people who mm. you know have um, lots of uh, hardware in their house or into home automation, who contribute to open source projects, who are still you know doing some interesting work. Uh, you know, hands-on interesting work and not just saying, you know, I, I, I do something completely different whenever I have free time. I think that's, uh, not, not to say that that's an absolute thing, but I think that's one indicator. Um, people who at some level love the machine, um, musicians, for example, are you know, usually that's a, a, a very positive sign, right? They want to master this instrument. Well, instrument, hardware, right? It's all kind of the same thing and, and that desire mm -hmm. to focus on it. I like, I think people who have an awareness of have mastered some things, have done the 10,000 hours, put the 10,000 hours in, but at the same time, recognize that there are areas that they're not so you know knowledgeable at and have a basic curiosity around that. I think those are, those are all important. But the most important at the end of the day is that they want to um, be part of it. They want to participate and um, you know those are the kinds of things I look for quite honestly when, whenever I hire and frankly that's how I, I feel I uh, operate. You know, it's, uh, I, I don't want to go somewhere where I wouldn't get the opportunities to do those things. And um, it's, so it's important to me. Interesting. And now let's let's get into a, a, a bit of your personal stuff. You as a professional, right? So if, if I say list one, two, three things that really help you be, be you what you are today, like what are, what are some, of the, some of the things that you say that, that define your success, if at all, like... Uh, what what are some of the things that you say? These are the hacks that I've uh, incurred, and th these really helped me, and probably could help someone else too. I'll, I think I've been super lucky to have some tremendous mentors, um, some CEOs and CTOs that I have worked for and with, um, building companies. I have uh, they have always taken the time to sit and explain what I didn't get, uh, identify for me where I didn't do it right. Uh, and to also to tell me where I did do a great job and what I should emphasize more. Um, those kinds of honest, direct conversations are uh, incredibly important. And I think, you know, people often report that they're rare in startups, that it's hard to get mentoring in startups. That's true, but I think that if you find the right startup for you, you will build those relationships with the, the founders and the other C-level folks. And, and so that's that's been huge for me. Um, the other thing is that I have, uh, as much as I've been a generalist, I have found some areas where I'm really passionate about it, like search. I, I truly believe search is the interface. I think there are plenty of examples that that, uh, that you know seem to argue for that every day, just about. And so I've always stayed with search, not pure mm. really general as a developer, and getting somewhat deep with something like search or big data or whatever it is. It's important not just to be you know broad in the sense that you can can take on any kind of technology problem. I think one should have at some level a, a a particular focus, um, even if it's not the only focus. So, uh, so those are two things that have worked for me. Interesting. Um, thank you so much for, the, for sharing that. Now, let's 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 talk about um, your favorite read. Um, do you love reading? What if you can share some some of the good reads for with the audience? I do. I um, actually I was a little late to it, but I just finished Arrival, which uh, there's a big movie about it. Right? It's a the Ted Chiang novel. Um, so the first. Really, the first short story in that is what's mostly in the movie. Um, there's a lot of really rich, and, and some of it's a little twisted, quite honestly, um, what, what else is in that book. But I think it's an incredible, visionary, forward-look take on a lot of things, and it's a, it's a challenging read. I, I definitely uh, think I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I also enjoy you know, more traditional stuff, whether it's business. I actually just reread Built to Last. Um, it's, it's you know a mm. little bit of a throwback, but um, I've always mm. loved it, and um, uh, I I also love you know science tr traditional science fiction, um, and uh, even occasionally we'll pick up a John Grisham novel if I have a long flight. So nice, nice. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. So um, 
we are almost at the end of the conversation and and said thank you so much for for spending time with us as as, as a um, as a parting uh, gesture so do you have any closing remark for our for our for our listeners i'll say this uh, you know i've been at this for uh, i've been lucky enough to work in tech for more than 20 years and i've seen a lot of changes most of them good um, and i think that you know the moves from whether it was client server to you know more distributed computing to the cloud and the web and mobile today you know they're all it's they're all so exciting um, but the key you know i think is to keep an open mind about how these things can can be used in the organization to uh, to enjoy it to embrace a little bit uh, the reality that we do live in the science fiction information age um, and to be mindful at the same time that you know there are humans all around us in these interactions. Um, it may be cool to build a predictor that tells you some very deep, or has some deep understanding of people's lives and the you know events that they go through. But how you use that is also important, right? I always always admired, even if I'm not sure they stay with it. Google's claim to do no evil or do no wrong. Mm. Uh, it's so hard to know what the computer is going to do, and without you know. Going overboard on Elon Musk's warnings about AI, um, I think it's it's important to remember that the customer is to be served. The goal is to bring them value and, and not and, and do it easily and not bring you know a negative uh, negative forces to bear on them. So uh, it's important to, to remember that and and to use your own you know your, use your own solutions right. Um, as they say, eat your own dog food. I think development organizations and generally solution to organizations that don't do that are missing uh, missing a maybe the most important boat. Interesting. With that, uh, couldn't have said any better. Thank you so much, Sid, again, uh, for spending time with time with us and sharing your insights. We are truly excited uh, and love to have you back in some time to discuss your journey from uh, in, in search and making some impact and, and good luck. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Great to talk with you. Likewise. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it Then I go into the booth feeling nervous Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless Is the mic on? I don't know how to work this Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side